Assalamualaikum, good morning, and hi everyone. Thank you to all our wonderful speakers for agreeing to speak at IDS webinar today, entitled The Corruption in the Supply Chain Forms an Impact on the Consumer. Thank you to all our participants joining in through our Zoom link and Facebook Live. We hope you will enjoy the session today, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave the comments at the Q&A box, and we will bring your questions to the floor. I am Salsabila Abdulmanan, the Executive Program Secretariat of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, IDS, and I will be your MC for our webinar today. Please, with a short housekeeping announcement. At IDS, we are committed to provide a safe environment for all parties, both internal and external, to work together. IDS has a policy of zero tolerance towards sexual exploitation and abuse. Everyone here today is this event a safe space for public discourse. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Mark Che, CEO of CBI, to give his welcoming remarks. Please welcome. Uh, Mark, we can't hear you. Good morning, uh, YB, Tansiri Tato Tato, distinguished guests from foreign missions, our partner, Mari, and ideas, ladies and gentlemen. Now, it has been our honor and uh, privilege to be involved in this research project on supply chain corruption jointly with ideas, supported by Mari and endorsed by MACC. It is undoubtedly our wish as fellow Raya of Malaysia to see our beloved nation prosper and compete successfully in the region, if not globally. There is no lack of talents in our nation. However, the nation's talents are not being utilized to the fullest because of systemic weaknesses accumulated over the decades. And one of these weaknesses is the corruption that has prevailed in both the private and public sector. Now, I, I just would like to show you a chart. Yeah? Just bear with me. All right. Now, this, <clears throat> this is a chart that shows how we fare since 2012. We improved marginally upwards until 2014. And from 2014 all the way to 2017, 2018, we dropped quite drastically. That was because of the revelation of the 1MDB scandal. And uh, in 2019, uh, when the scandal was brought to court, the CPI for Malaysia improved. And then thereafter, because of changes in the political landscape, it dropped again in 2010. Now, as we go further to analyze this data, looking at per capita income for the nation and compare with CPI score among the Asian tigers, and that is the chart that you will see. Now you notice that in the 60s, eh, 1960, um, the data is right that we were actually about the same as other Asian tigers, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan. All right, we, the capital income was quite the same. But you just take a look at the years that follows, all the way down to 2020. Now, <clears throat> you notice that the highest score of CPI 85, Singapore, is the one that achieved a higher per capita income and so forth all the way down. Malaysia is still trying to manage an upward trend, all right? So we were actually at the bottom of the whole graph. Now, <clears throat> this is not just pertinent to the Asian uh, countries. If you care to pick up data from around the world, comparing per capita income and the CPI score, the same trend exists.
Now, <clears throat> according to the World Bank, the average income in countries with high level of corruption is about a third of that countries with low level of corruption. Some of the effects of uh, corruption uh, impacting economy are high prices of low quality of goods and services, inefficiency of resource distribution, uneven distribution of wealth, low stimulus for innovation, distorted cost structure, disincentive for foreign direct investment. Now you will, you will also notice that there has been some talk in the marketplace um, among multinational, even Chamber of Commerce, talking about if we continue to manage our economy the, the way that we are doing, uh, we can actually drive a very more and more FDIs. Now in the 2012 Bright Payers Survey, Transparency International uh, pulled 3,000 executives around the world from 30 countries. And the question asked was whether they lost business in the past year because competitors pay a bribe. And in Malaysia, 50% of those surveys said yes. And it was reported in the Wall Street Journal that among these countries, Malaysia is the worst country in terms of um, cost of doing business. And this chart was actually drawn many times in the media. Now, <clears throat> in 2014, CBI was established as a not-for-profit a political organization championing business equity in the marketplace. What we have seen is there are a lot of um, NGO, a lot of organization talking about, about corruption and some focus on the public uh, domain, um, government procurement, uh, TI Malaysia, they focus on polling and advocacy. And uh, we notice that there's a lack of focus on the bright payer, which is the private sector. That is why we set up CBI, uh, trying to champion integrity in doing business. <clears throat> we recognize the failure to curb corruption and enhance the level of integrity in our environment, in our management of resources, will deter us from becoming a high income nation. Uh, CBI uh, aimed to combat corruption on two fronts, namely in the marketplace, by gathering like minded business entities to join us and uphold integrity. And we also offer training to institutions of learning. And uh, I, shall, I shall leave the presentation of the research report to our colleagues from IDEAS. And that's uh, what I would wish to say for better Malaysia, we need to change our mindset, tune ourselves to integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for the short presentation and welcoming remarks. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Trisha Yeo, our Chief Executive Officer, Ideas, to give her welcoming remarks. Please welcome. Thank you very much to Salsa Bila, our MC for today. Firstly, greetings to my fellow panelists, YB Dr. Lee Bun Chai, MP of Goping and former Deputy Minister of Health, Mr. Alex Tan, Partner and Risk Consulting Leader from PwC Malaysia, R. Nadeswaran, activist and former journalist. Uh, many of us would have read his columns over the years. Johnson Chong, core team of Raswa Busters, and Dr. Haji Mazlan Haji Ahmad, the Deputy President of Malaysia Corruption Watch and a member of the MACC Operations Review Panel. A very warm welcome to all our guests today as well, uh, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday morning. Um, we have quite a large number of people following this, which also signifies, I believe, the level of importance that this topic is to many Malaysians. Uh, I also like to thank CBI, the Coalition for Business Integrity, for what has been a very productive collaboration over the last uh, year. 
So we have collaborated to do this report that is being launched today as we speak, um, titled The Corruption in the Supply Chain Forms an Impact on Consumers. Of course, uh, I'd like to echo Mark in thanking uh, Mari and MACC for the support that they've provided thus far throughout this process. Uh, just a quick word for those of you who don't know about IDEAS, the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. We are an independent public policy think tank and we support evidence-based policies and we do so by various means, publications, roundtable discussions and public webinars or previously conferences, right, events. Uh, webinar is the new normal. And we do this to um, ensure that the research that we are doing has a strong advocacy point to the various stakeholders that we meet, which includes members of the government, political leaders, media, other intellectuals, think tanks, academics, and more. So friends, Malaysia has been faced with this unprecedented pandemic and political crisis over the last one and a half years. And this, we do not see an end to any time soon, even despite the vaccination rollout, um, which has been choppy initially. I think now it has smoothened over. Um, however, the situation that we are facing with the double or perhaps even triple crisis, because it's also an economic crisis, which I'll come to, this will undoubtedly prolong. And uh, I, as well as many other leaders of industry, leaders of civil society and, and think tanks alike, have all stressed on the importance for Malaysia and our administration to address the structural and institutional failures of our political economy. If this is not the time to do it, when else will we be able to do so? I believe that the pandemic only accelerated, it merely highlighted and, and shed light on the structural and fundamental problems that had already been ailing our economy for many years. So governance is key for the flourishing of any economy, for the return of investor confidence. Investments into a country requires the sort of predictability and environment that has Stability. And why do I say all this in an event that speaks on corruption? I say this because in order to achieve a predictable environment, a political economy in which investors and the private sector and consumers as well will be able to appreciate um, how they can go about their businesses in everyday life they require that corruption does not feature heavily. What corruption does is that it provides undue favors over one side, and this results in an economy that is structurally flawed, where externalities can reign. And in our report, uh, we have looked at the various forms of corruption, which we include as bribery, extortion, embezzlement, fraud, favoritism. Uh, we've also looked at the causes of corruption. Uh, I won't go into great detail because the report is there, but to put it simply, there is information asymmetry for personal gains. And if this is allowed to flourish, public officials that abuse their positions and exercise their discretion over the public will result in negative outcomes. And so we heard many times uh, in the course of the research, and I'll talk a bit about that soon, is that there's this grease the wheel hypothesis. I'm sure those of us who have been involved in this process um, will also attest to how businesses are obliged to uh, perhaps provide this grease, which then can lubricate and smoothen over the various bureaucratic processes. Finally, there are also cultural reasons why corruption can flourish, especially when individuals view acts of corruption as the standard operating procedure in doing business in Malaysia. So friends, um, I think if I were to underscore one main point from the report, and this is what we would really like to emphasize today, because as my colleague Mark mentioned earlier, 
research and, um, and, and analysis on corruption has abounded in the past, even in Malaysia. But I think the key here and what is the difference that we are trying to present, at the heart of it, what is the consequence of corruption? The heart of it is that corruption increases the cost of living, where goods and services become more expensive, and it is systemic, therefore it affects us on a daily basis, artificially inflating the cost of living. Um, I will let my colleague Uni speak about the methodology, but in short, we looked at three sectors and uh, we conducted interviews, uh, literature review, secondary research to ultimately come to the conclusion that corruption does indeed increase consumer prices and reduces incomes as well. So there's a double whammy effect. We have six specific recommendations, which are related to improving the NACP, addressing pub public procurement, targeting policies towards transparency, emerging with an independent MACC, empowering the private sector and simplifying the regulatory environment. Uh, the details will be presented shortly by my colleague. I will just end here, just um, a reminder to all, all of us that if we are truly serious about a post-pandemic economic recovery, we cannot rest on our laurels and governance, which includes addressing systemic corruption, is one of the lowest hanging fruits that we can do in order to ensure the best returns on every ringgit that is spent. Thank you very much once again, and I'll be coming back shortly uh, to moderate the panel. Thank you. Back to you, Salsabila. Thank you, Trisha, for your welcoming remarks. And um, before we move forward, I would like to lay down the tentative for today. We will have a 20 minutes presentation by Sri Muniati, Senior Manager, Public Finance Unit Ideas on the Corruption in the Supply Chains, form an impact, impact on consumer paper that will be released officially today. And then we will have the panel with our speakers, YB Dr. Lee Boon Chai, Mr. R. Nadisporan, Mr. Alex Tan, Mr. Johnson Chong, and Dr. Haji Mazlan. So Trisha will be the moderator for the session. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them on the Q&A box and we will get back to you. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Sri Muniati to proceed with her presentation. Please welcome. Uh, thank you, Sally, uh, and good morning, morning everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to share my screen now. Can you all see this? How is it? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And thank you for the uh, summary, Trisha. I think that's really helped laying out the, the context of the conversation. Uh, as, as, as discussed earlier, I'm going to present some of the findings of the report. The report is available in IDS website. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna share some, some of the findings of this report. As Mark earlier mentioned, uh, one of the uh you know impetus behind this this research is we want to understand to what extent corruption everyday corruption especially impact on con consumers especially on prices and to what extent this impact then will will have a negative effect on cost of living so the main questions of of the of the report is actually how does corruption negatively impact consumers in malaysia and most importantly what action can be taken to address it uh, these, these questions is quite large, so we focus our, our research on three main sectors. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, constructions and mostly property development sector. Uh, because we will see, I think, that will corruption will, will affect house prices. Uh, the second and, and on education and the last one on healthcare. Uh, another objective that we want to achieve from doing this research is to explain how this form of corruption then can impact, impact consumers. Uh, another objective is to test the relationship between corruption and price level in Malaysia. And last, last but not least is to provide recommendation for the government and also relevant stakeholders to address it. So as Trisha mentioned earlier, so this research is, is a combination between uh, a very small quantitative research and qualitative research. So we rely our data on semi-structured interviews uh, with stakeholders. The, this interview carried out by CBI researchers with 
hundreds uh, of, of stakeholders in these three um, uh, sectors. And this interview took place last year. So any development after December 2020, we are sorry if we can't cover, cover it, but please uh, give us uh, input on this. But uh, that's the limitation on in terms of, of scope of this research. So the, secondly, we also do uh, some desktop research. We do we read and review literature on corruptions because we need a framework to analyze the interview result, as well as we consult other research on, on corruptions and other relevant documents and sources to ensure that the data finding is consistent. Uh, another way of we, we do a, a small economic econometric analysis on the relationship between corruption and price level. We mirror uh, an international study, and I will uh, share the, the result later. Last but not least, after this first finding, uh, we had a stakeholder consultation, a closed door discussion for two days with three different uh, stakeholders group. Uh, and we share with them the preliminary finding and gain uh, more feedback and input on, on the research. So these are the, the methodologies of, of the research. Let me share now some of the finding. So, uh, so the first thing that we try to do with this research is to identify uh, forms of corruptions. You know, what are type of corruptions that are actually taking place in these three sectors? Corruptions, we use a very general uh, definitions of corruption introduced by Transparency International. It's any abuse of entrusted power for private gain. I think this definition is broad enough for us to capture any corrupt practices uh, at the private sector, as well as public sector, as well as cover those who solicit bribe or solicit corrupt uh, act to those who give it. And also it will capture any, I think, uh, classifications of, of corruptions from bureaucratic corruptions, grand corruption. So this is quite broad, uh, broad enough definition that capture all forms of corruptions. However, we also realize that this definitions is quite, quite big and we need some forms of, you know, some, some uh, analytical tool to understand the forms of corruption. So we come up with, after reading the, the result of the view, this one research that particularly I think in, uh, useful for us to identify these forms and this research by an expert, uh, uh, a scholar of, of corruptions in Sweden, which is Amundsen. And he identified uh, five forms or five concepts of corruptions that actually all know, I think. So the first one is bribery. Of course, bribery is the, you know, the, the most uh, classic form of corruption where someone paid someone else, especially those in authority, so that this person will provide a, a better treatment, you know, uh, uh, faster services, or even not, not to not to not, uh, not ignoring certain uh, violations of rule. So that's bribery. Another forms of corruption that we that we taken from Amundsen's is extortions, and we will see later. I will explain later how are these forms, uh, you know, uh, we can find in in these three sectors. Extortions, of course, is, is different from bribery, slightly different. It's the same thing. Sometimes it's used payment of money or, or other non-monetary uh, payment, but it involves coercion. Someone, especially at, in, at those who have authority, extort payment so that they can either deliver service or look, look down on, on certain, look, you know, they don't, don't look into certain violations. Another uh, the third form of corruption that Amundsen uh, identified is embezzlement. This is basically theft of resources, right? Someone with authority, it has access or are given uh, a given trust to deliver or to use to take care of resources. They take it for themselves. So that's embezzlement. This is one form of corruption. Another form is fraud. This is something that I think some sometimes people don't really see it as a corruption. But this is misrepresentation of facts, for example, false claims, uh, anything related to misrepresentation of fact, that, that also act of corruption, that, and that's what we call fraud. And we can see it later, uh, these forms in different sectors. The last one that sometimes maybe this is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, controversial is favoritism. Basically giving, you know, people who are close to us or to those with authority, some well special treatment or some special uh, grant or something some people don't don't view it as, as an act of corruption itself but 
when say for example act of favoritism then lead to uh, act of of corruption then corrupt practices actually have been taken place so let's see how how this form of corruption manifests in in different sectors uh, so in construction sectors our interviewer uh, mostly talked to people who work in property development sector and we after the interview we identified that the risk of corruptions happen mainly in two uh, uh, two stages first one you, during pre development uh, this one, our interviewee, for example, uh, identify number of multiple payments of bribes to smoothen the land, the land conversions and submission on, on infrastructure plans. I think one of the interview even say that this will represent about 14 to 4 to 14 percent of the cost of, of, of the development. So we, I will come back to it later at the end. So another one is that that our interviewee uh, identify is this kickback to secure credit from the bank. So this all happened during the pre-development phase, and we will see later that it actually contribute to the cost of the of the of the property. Uh, in during the the development stage, when the developer starts, you know, uh, tendering the project, finding contractors to deliver, a lot of things happening as well. Uh, and this one, I think, some of the interviewee uh, talks about. Uh, the need to bribe the main developer to give them con to give uh, to give subcontractors the contract, right? So this this bribe can be in the form of money, but most of the time in the forms of entertainment. For example, from going to you know nice restaurants, uh, so uh, you know giving some hampers or things like that, and and some people see it as it's a norm, you know, it's it's, it's a cost of doing business. So you just have to do it, otherwise you will not get it. Another uh, area of risk during the development period is the bribe to secure foreign workers. And this is, uh, I think our uh, interview, we found that in, in many construction uh, sites that the developer have to pay certain amount of money so that they can secure the number of, certain number of foreign workers. Another one that I, I find it interesting is uh, when when the developer procure ar architectural materials, you know, like uh, from uh, say for example uh, tiles and everything. So this will also have uh, can ha has a risk of of corruption as well, where certain uh, engineer, for example, will recommend certain brands or certain things, certain things to change, and as a result, they will lower the price a little bit but the this remaining price will be given then to the you know to the person who recommend the, the changes or to recommend certain product another one that i think uh, another important part so after this is happening uh, towards the end of of the development period when the developer want to secure a certificate of completion there are other phases that they need to to do right so they have to ensure that all the or they have to go to uh, different agencies to ensure that the, the building is safe and everything. So during this period, various forms of corruption can also take place. I think one developer shared with us that they are, they are he or she being asked to, be, to, to, be, to give payment to, so they can get, uh, so he or she can get certificate of completions. However, based on his, uh, on his, uh, you know, recorded, he did not, he did not do that. But these are some of the things that actually can happen during the development stage of, of the construction. Unfortunately, uh, our research, our interviewer, did not uh, find any risk of corruptions after the condo or the housing built. So this is something probably that I, I would love to do more research on how corruption can actually take place during the post-development stage. In education sectors, our interviewee identified this form of corruption in at least three, three sectors. In the, in the private uh, early childhood education, uh, uh, I think some, some of the operators, they complain of the need for them to pay certain amount of money to get licenses. Uh, so say for example, uh, TASCA or TADICA, if before they before they establish, they need to go to 
JKM, they need to secure fire license and everything. So they have to ensure that all buildings actually comply with certain requirements. So in order to get that, they have to they have to engage with certain you know operator to get past those license. And sometimes, of course, in some the, the task operator, for example, they establish um, you know their their premises in residential areas. So they have to convert the land, to convert the the private the, the 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 property into certain status. That also will require some some payment. Another one that I think that the the, the interviewer share with us is when they have to combine between the tasca and the tadika, based on rules that is actually uh, prohibited, but because the nature of business require them to do so. So when inspection times come, they have to pay certain you know, payment so that the, the, the inspector will just look over and they don't, you know, they, they don't make a fuss about it. Uh, so these are some forms of corruption that happen in, in, in early childhood education. Another one that we find in public school is, I think this is repeatedly, not repeatedly, we found several instances of, of bribe to secure, for example, support letter for winning school canteen operator. Uh, and, and of course, some of them get caught by the MACC, you know, but we, it's just the, the amount we, we don't know, like how much, what's the extent of this kind of corruption actually happening in public school. Another one is, this is something that I want to mention as well, because some of the interviewee actually raised this. In higher education, for example, solic solicitations of payment to pass exams or obtain high grade. So these are forms of corruption that happen in education. I will go a little bit faster. The last one is in healthcare. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have uh, enough, uh, you know, we don't have, we, we can't secure a significant number of interviews, but several interviews that we, that we had, uh, some of some of them identify the risk of, you know, this pro improper incentive for medical practitioner to prescribe certain drug uh, or certain medical product. That as a result they will they will be given incentive either by pharmaceutical companies, so that you know so and and, and as a result of course then patients like us who sometimes don't do our own research then follow whatever the, you know, the doctors or any medical practitioner uh, uh, gave to us. However, our interviewer also mentions about, I think, uh, so the, the concern of, of corruption in, in, drug, uh, in drug prescription, uh, I think mirrored by this, by this finding, I think WHO back in 2006 did some research on how medicine registration, selection, and procurement actually done in Southeast Asian countries. Malaysia, if you can see here, is quite okay, but I think our finding, some of the things that we find in our interview mirror this research that selections of drug actually quite still quite risky. Uh, like here, I think it's indicated 5.7, so it's still moderately um, vulnerable to corruption. Uh, while, of course, we have to acknowledge, and this is also being shared by our interviewee, that the government has done quite a number of initiatives to actually ensure that especially private sectors procurement, drug procurement follow certain practices. So these are some of the initiatives here. I put it in the screen here. So there is actually what, what, we, what we know as pharma code. The pharma code actually require all medical practitioners and any stakeholders to follow certain, certain practices, including not allowing of having this, you know, improper incentive in, in selecting or procuring drugs. And there's this other uh, governance as well, provided by, by government as well as, well as uh, private sectors. Um, Uni, or, I think you really need to speed up. Okay. So, or, or you might have to skip some slides. Okay. Okay. The forms of corruption, another form of corruption that was being identified by the by the interviewers is extortion. So if we can see here, I think not many uh, instances, but we find in construction, for example, there's a, so, some of the construction uh, players, they complain of unscheduled and frequent inspections of the construction sites uh, from, you know, uh, uh, Majlis Bandaraya that show that 
if the construction sites are not clear or clean, they will come and you know then they ask for 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 bribe to to ensure that it's not being recorded. To another, this is another typical complaint is inspections on foreign workers, and I think some of some of the players actually said that they have to stop the construction process because the the foreign workers are being taken by the authorities. Uh, another one, again, I, I mentioned before, the inspections in, in private sector, uh, early childhood education operators, inspection happening, uh, and they're being asked to, to pay certain amount of money so that certain violations in, in, you know, in the running of the premises are being, are being uh, uh, ignored by the authorities. Let me go. So now let, let, let's move on to how these form are different forms of corruptions impact uh, uh, consumers. I think research have shown a lot of research on, on corruptions has shown that corruptions is neg is a negative for economic development for uh, that it, it create an efficient allocation of resources. But I think one important research that came up recently in 2015 is it show clearly that that corruption actually impose markup on goods and services prices. So if we can see here, so if, if the corruption's not happen, so we can get like really market prices. However, uh, if then corruption comes in, that there's certain uh, additional uh, cost to it. A research by Budak and Fizek in 2015 shows that if the corruption increased by 1%, so the, the CPI score decreased, meaning the corruption increased 1%, the price, the general price level, any price will increase by 0.135%. So that's small, but however, for in, in, in uh, consumer services, in services, it will increase by 0.25%. That's quite substantial. Uh, another research that, we, that someone else done in, in, in India is actually illegal payoffs or bribes or any extortions can actually increase the, 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 the cost of construction in India to as high as 30%. We try to uh, emulate uh, Budak and Fizek research here in Malaysia. So unfortunately, the result uh, is not consistent with it. So while it's, it has a negative there, so if you can see the blue here, the, the third and fourth uh, row here, so the control of corruptions, both in real time and lag effect, which is one year earlier, it's negative, but it's not significant enough. Uh, it's, it's still consistent with uh, this research that I mentioned earlier. So in developed countries, uh, the, the same result also uh, seen, but one, one of the way to explain it is maybe the level of corruptions is not high enough, so it doesn't impact price. But in our case, uh, this is something that we want to do in the future. Unfortunately, the, the, the samples that we had for this research is quite small, and I think that effect uh, the result that we uh, that I, I show here that you know the level of corruption does not have significant effect on the price level. Uh, however, uh, there's another research. I, our interview, however, provide a very interesting insight on the hypothetical cost that can incur by corruption, especially in the property development sector. If you can see here, our, our uh, interviewee uh, identify two examples of property development sectors. One that has the value of 200 million, another one is 500 million. So here you can see different type of, of corruption from bribe during the pre-development stage to different kind of uh, extortions during development stage can actually incur cost between 5.8% to 14.8%. So that's that's quite high. Uh, so say for example, yeah, our house is 100 million or 300 million, so plus 14%. So that you know, it, it is it's probable that some of the costs in our property development sectors actually come from these corrupt practices. Another uh, cost that I think uh, it will impact the, the cost of living, uh, our cost of living, is because corruption result in less government efficient spending. Our uh, interviewee especially uh, identifies several, uh, 
se several uh, instances of corruption where then it, it result in the delays of government service delivery, for example, in hospital. I think here one of the respondents from Sarawak say that, you know, we, we've, they've been waiting for, for the hospital project to come, but it didn't take place. So where the government has poured in some money to buy the hospital, to, to build the hospital, this hospital was not built on time. And as a result, of course, you know, then the local people, instead of going to this place, will then fork out more money to go somewhere else, or maybe go to private hospital, which is a lot more expensive than going to the government hospital. And this is part of it is contributed by any corrupt practices that, that may happen during the, the procurement or during the constructions of the hospital. Okay, let's move on to the recommendation. So what can we do? There's a lot of things that's been, you know, we discussed and what can we do to, to actually address all this problem? So I think as, as mentioned by Tricia earlier, one of the way the, the wider anti-corruption strategy is to strengthen the MACC. I think we've been talking about uh, the need for MACC to be independent, to have, to have for example, the office of the, uh, the, the chief commissioner, the, the chief commissioner to be, to be, uh, to be, um, to be more independent and being selected by a panel of, of uh, you know, in parliament. Another, another important recommendations, I think, that uh, is, is to maintain the momentum of the NACP. The National anti-corruption uh, plan is really good, is, is a decent plan to actually move the effort of Malaysia to combat corruption forward. And there are, I think I, I, we identify here at least four, uh, for uh, area or for initiative in the anti-corruption plan that actually can can address certain problems that identified by this report. For example, uh, this initiative um, in the NACP is actually try to to issue the problem of the issuance of permit and licensing. And if if actually the government is now uh, implementing it, all these you know risky areas in permit and licensing should be addressed by December 2023. Another area I think that is important that is now is being in place is to have this, uh, to support the Corporate Liability Act where, where private sectors should actually adopt anti-corruption program, the certain uh, you know, standard in, in anti-bribery so that then they can be, they, they internal integrity system can be better to, uh, to address corruption. Um, another one is one thing very important, but it's not yet happening, is to introduce legislations on procurement activities. And I, as we can see earlier, a lot of, especially in, in the delivery of healthcare services, uh, most of the time, especially in public sector, uh, the services are not delivered because procurement activities are not being done properly. So it's very important for the government to have a, a procurement legislation and there's a plan to it, but unfortunately, I think not unfortunately, we haven't seen any move until today on how this thing will move forward. And another important thing that actually is already put there in the NACP, so uh, is to have a transparent management of foreign workers. Uh, so there are certain areas in the NACP that actually have the you know, we can move things forward and there are certain things that can be addressed by the NACP. Uh, however, there are other things I think that's also important. Uh, we've been talking about the need for us to, amendment, to amend the Whistleblower Protection Act. Uh, another area that we need to do is to simplify regulatory environment. I think a lot of things that happen, especially uh, like, you know, just complaints from, from, you know, from business players, is because the regulatory in, in environment is being made difficult. So that, that's why the, to grease the wheel, they pay a certain amount of money. So there's a need to continuously improve the regulatory environment so that business, uh, you know, the, 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 the business uh, environment will be made even, even more effective and efficient. Uh, last but not least, I think I put here is to promote more competitive and innovative market. Uh, Malaysia has been trying to do it. I think one of the things Mal uh, the government has tried to improve Malaysia's uh, ranks in, in World Bank of doing business, but the need for, for it to improve it in the future is, is even more. 
So Trisha, thank you for that. I hope that that can open up some, some discussion. And, right. and have a good day. Thank you very much, Uni. Um, that was a very informative presentation. I think um, we are actually, we don't have that much time. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into it. So uh, once again, thank you to Uni and to Salsa Bella. I think I'll take over from here on. I'm going to chair uh, the rest of the one hour plus session. So I'd like to first start um, with YB Dr. Lee Bun Chai, who is the Member of Parliament of Goping and as well the former Deputy Minister of Health. Um, YB Dr. Lee is a Supreme Council Member of Parti Keadilan Rakyat and he's been a Member of Parliament for Goping since 2008. Um, YB can comment perhaps on the healthcare aspects of the report and the presentation and YB, I'll just pass the time over to you right now. <clears throat> Thank you, Tricia, um, Mark Che, SKT Director, Coalition for Business Integrity, fellow panelists, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Mm, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this forum. It is indeed an honor to be able to share with you my thoughts with my limited experience in the Ministry of Health, hardly uh, 20 months. I think this study has highlighted three areas uh, under healthcare. Uh, first of all, is the pharma sponsorship of healthcare professionals uh, regards to the use of drugs. I think it also highlighted that uh, cell regulation in this area actually helps, where there is a pharma code of ethics uh, from the pharma pharmaceutical aspect, but there is also the medical professionals' uh, code of ethics to govern this uh, sponsorship, which helped to actually reduce sort of uh, abuse or corrupt practice in this area. Uh, of course, there's other area about procurement of uh, pharmaceutical products and so on, which I will touch a bit later in the third part on the construction of the hospitals. And um, I think one aspect's impact on this uh, abuse or uh, failure or corrupt practice in healthcare it just not impact on the final cost to the consumer. It actually caused disruption of services as what has been said. And more importantly, it also impact on the safety of the patients. So I think for, for medical care, the safety is additional area where we should look at uh, where it will impact uh, on the consumer. Uh, I think the hospital cost overruns, uh, which were highlighted in the report, even though I think presented have no time to uh, go through. Uh, I think you can read the report about Tanyukarang Hospital, about Shah Alam Hospitals, where the cost was about 2 million per bed, as compared to some private hospital, which can be constructed at about uh, 800,000 per bed. But of course, uh, I've raised this question when in my time in the ministry about why should it be costing so much? Of course, there will be a usual argument. Government hospital has to be very complete. You need to have mortuary, you need to have enough uh, parking space, you need to have uh, other accessory uh, facilities, uh, complete facilities, even though you are not the top of the range hospitals. So I think if you were to ben benchmark some private hospitals, it may even it may still cost, say about 1.5 to 2 million uh, ringgit per bed, like Prince Court is costing about 2 million. I'm not trying to defend what has been practiced, but I do know that whatever it is, uh, the government hospitals are, construction of government hospital is costing at least 50 to 100% more than what is in the private hospital. And those two hospitals which were cited were not uh, the first. And unfortunately, they won't be the last. Uh, I can quote with you, share with you some other hospitals which have cost overruns. Hospital Lawas in Sarawak, uh, ET Baded non specialist hospital, uh, is started, uh, is quoting at about 175 million for 80 beds, supposed to start in 2012 and should have completed, should have completed a uh, long time ago, uh, five years ago, but until now, 
uh, is still not uh, not completed. It's expected to be only completed in 2023. And the final cost per bid is going to be about 3 million per bid. Uh, this is a non-specialist uh, small uh, hospitals. Hospital Burra in Pahang, a 40 bed hospital uh, con given a contract for 88 million and it's supposed to be completed in 2015. And uh, cost overrun at the end, it costs about 120 million ringgit and uh, just completed last year. Hospital put Petra Jaya in Kuchin, Sarawak, where tender was terminated in 2018. And it was supposed to have completed in 2016. Uh, and now we need to have tender. I'm sure it would be another hospital which will cost more than 2 million a bit. So I think service disruption also not just impact on the ordinary uh, riot, but it also impact on the planning of the Ministry of Health because they are trained nurses, trained uh, paramedics who are trained by Ministry of Health. <coughs> they were waiting to be posted and couldn't get their posting for over a year because all these facilities were delayed. So this actually affects not just uh, taxpayers' money, it affects patient safety and also impact on the training program. But I think we've got to be clear about what, what are the things under Ministry of Health directly and what are the things which are multi-ministerial function. I think to begin, to begin with, uh, those functions which are purely Ministry of Health are mainly regulatory functions like licensing and law enforcement under Ministry of Health. I think on this licensing and law enforcement, I must say that uh, Ministry of Health has been very transparent, very transparent. And you can see how you can apply for registration of drugs, vaccines, and apply for new hospitals, new clinics. Everything can be done on website. And there is a time frame as to how long ministry should uh, evaluate and approve that. So on that part, I think ministry is very transparent. Of course, the other part is uh, service delivery. But a lot has been said are uh, actually areas which are involving other ministry like procurement of drugs, vaccines, and outsourcing of services, like cleaning, maintenance of hospitals, equipments, and awards of contracts like construction of hospitals and clinics, and also privatization of some of the projects. This actually involves other ministry, including, uh, including Ministry of Finance, Public Works Ministry, and PM's department, because some building a hospital taking, for example, the Ministry of Health as the owner of the project actually gets the money from Ministry of Finance. And the implementing agency is actually Public Works Department. So implementing, making sure that the project is running on time is under Public Works Department. And a lot of the time there is a tender board which involves of course, all the, all the trade ministry, but there are instances in the past where Ministry of Finance actually overrule the tender board and do direct nego and award the project. I think this has been exposed in the audit report. So I think some of this uh, I can share with you last point about some of this problem uh, failure, delay are uh, caused by poor planning, poor coordination, and of course, incompetent contract contractors. But one of the problem is problem with actually with the finance ministry. There is some rules and regulations like I share here with you one of the project in Ipoh, uh, maternal and child and cardiology block in Hospital Raja Pemaisuri Bainon Ipoh, General Hospital Ipoh, the new block. 
uh, the contract was given to a main con. But mechanical and electrical contract were appointed by Ministry of Finance directly. And so the civil work is by the main con, M&E by another contractor. There are lots of coordination problems and the main con has got no control over the M&E contractor. And it caused a lot of delay and it took almost 10 years before the whole building is completed. So these are some of the policy where we should look at uh, in terms of grouping out the problems of the cause of delay. But I must say, before I sum up, the root cause of delays and failures certainly needs to be addressed apart from abuse, apart from corruption. There are also existing policy which allow for incompetent contractors, existing procedure, which uh, make difficult, make life difficult for, for contractors. And also there is slow in adoption of innovative ideas and there's a very rigid uh, application of the existing procedures. So the project would invariably cause cost overruns. And I think this is a systemic problem. It's not just with Ministry of Health. I think it's uh, prevalent in all other ministries and virtually in all projects by the government of Malaysia. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Raibi, Dr. Lee Bun Chai. A very frank um, admission, I think, of the cost overruns that we have experienced in Malaysia. And it's, uh, I think, ultimately, I mean, the theme of the day is how it affects the consumers. And you mentioned at the start that what this does is it impacts on the safety of hospitals, which therefore impacts on the safety of patients. And this, um, this, is, this is a really terrible revelation because uh, how sure are we that when we are actually going and attending these hospitals, um, that the, the slipshod nature of procurement, whether it's in, in physical infrastructure or the devices that are purchased, actually result in uh, negative consequences to the consumers. So thank you very much, YB. Um, I'd now like to move on to our second panelist, Alex Tan, who is a partner and risk consulting leader from PwC Malaysia. Um, he's also PwC's forensic leader for Southeast Asia Consulting and helps clients to prevent, detect, and emerge stronger from risk and economic crime, including fraud, corruption, conflicts of interest, and money laundering. So very well placed to talk about the various issues that we are talking about today. Um, interestingly, he has also spent eight years with the New Zealand Serious Fraud Office and uh, therefore could make some interesting comparisons between New Zealand and Malaysia. So um, Alex, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tricia, and thanks, everybody. Um, and, and thanks to Ideas and, and, and Mark Che's tenacity in pulling together this report, one of the first I've seen. And, and I think it's, it's testament to the fact that, you know, no one's really looked at this before, the cost of, of the supply chain uh, corruption and, and what it costs the country and the housing and, you know, what it adds on to your house, etc. And I think that sort of underlines some of the theme that I want to talk about is to do to combat corruption we've got to look at new try new things not be afraid of trying new things to to have have a have a look at it so uh, my comments are my personal comments today uh, I, I'll stress that I've been in Malaysia now nine and a half years gained 15 to 20 kilos on durian and nasi lemak um, uh, and hockey and me um, trying to lose it all at, at the moment um, my background is in law enforcement. I was with the Hong Kong police previous to, to that um, and commercial crime. And then I spent eight years in the New Zealand Serious Fraud Office, which has an uh, overview of uh, corruption in New Zealand. And even though New Zealand is always like number one or two on the transparency list, there is there is a high level of corruption there. If, if, if you look, no, no country is immune. Um, and then I joined PwC in New Zealand 2005, moved here 2000 and, and 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 12 so that that's my background so a couple of things around around the the private sector i mean it, i think what the the report's highlighting is that there is a cost to corruption that you know there's no as i, I told you there's no free lunch in this world okay you either the the cost in our supply chain either gets evidenced in substandard product substandard infrastructure 
And I grew up in, in Hong Kong from about eight years old. My father was working there in the construction industry. And this is before ICAC came in. They came in, I think I moved there in 74 as a young man. Uh, uh, I won't, uh, it shows you how old I am, I presume, by saying that. Uh, and I can swim. And ICAC came into being in Hong Kong, and that's the Independent Commission Against Corruption in 76, where corruption was quite uh, endemic in Hong Kong. And now corruption is reasonably lower in, in Hong Kong with ICAC. So I saw that generational change, and it takes a generation to change it. But just one of these things, you know, where there's no free lunch that I talk about. I remember, you know, there are all these signs that you can't take sand from the beach in Hong Kong. People say, oh, why is that? You want to preserve the beach? No, well, in the old days, the contractors used to take all the sand from the beach for construction. Of course, that's salty sand. And um, and you'd get all these buildings falling down because all the, con uh, the steel reinforcing would be rusted away. Um, and that was down to corruption because they were having to pay bribes to get... Um, to get uh, licenses for the construction, et cetera. So you have to save the money somewhere, otherwise it comes out of your margin. So, you know, the, the this is a very important study because the cost has got to be passed on and borne somewhere. Either your house is, is, is built to pretty average standards and potentially dangerous, uh, or the cost is passed on to you. And we're seeing that at the moment in a number of matters, which I can't talk about uh, that, that we're working on at the moment where the cost does get get passed on. So it's in everybody's interest that, that, that we, we deal with this. So, so how are we going to deal with it? Uh, it was interesting listening to uh, Dr. Lee a moment ago talking about hospitals and that. And, and everyone uses this word corruption fairly loosely. You know, um, I was just reading in the New Zealand newspaper the other day that they, they are, uh, Dr. Lee talked about hospitals having to run mortuaries and car parts. Well, they're accusing the public hospitals in New Zealand of corruption because public hospitals probably around the world feel underfunded and, and potentially they are. And so they're charging extortionate rates to park at the hospital because that helps fill their coffers. So there's a big uh, outcry as to, you know, corrupt practices by the hospitals in New Zealand um, by charging um, people visiting sick relatives, you know, a huge amounts and nurses, etc. Is that really corruption? No, it's not. It's just a use use of the term uh, loosely. Um, Trisha asked me to, you know, to, to to draw some comparisons from what I've seen working around the world, and that to, that that could be dealt with here. And and I have to be clear: Malaysia's its own country, its own culture. New Zealand's its own country. Norway's its own country. Singapore's its its own country. But I'll just I'll I'll, I'll, I'll offer some thoughts as to what I've seen from a personal point of view. So one of, one of the uh, things I see here, and you're probably aware of the power index um, uh, uh, study. And, and that basically says that um, to what extent do people feel equal in society from the top to the bottom, okay? So I'll just, so forgive me, I'll look at my phone because I just, I couldn't remember the numbers, um, but the, uh, the power distance index is called, right? So the higher the number, the more unequal people feel, i.e. they feel that the people at the top end of society are more powerful, my voice doesn't matter, what they do they can get away with, etc. So this I think is a very, very clear uh, uh, thing that, we, we, that needs to be addressed. So if I look at that, so the higher the number, the worse it is, okay? So the, the lowest number in the world is Austria with 11, okay? New Zealand, where I came from, is 22. So more egalitarian, more fee, you know, people am I. So New Zealand's 22. Um, our colleagues in Singapore's at 74, probably around 15. Highest in the world is Malaysia at 104. Okay. So we have the highest out of all recorded countries powered in the power in uh, distance index, which shows that people feel that they are um not as equal as people with a title maybe more senior and i i can i can see that i was i was uh, you probably heard of jacinda ardern uh, uh, the very popular prime minister of new zealand um about six months ago she went her and and clark gave her her, her her fiance went to a cafe on sunday for lunch and they were made to wait in line because the seats weren't available and they couldn't go to the front of the queue 
they get treated like everybody else, and they expect that. They 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 get to, um, you know, the, there are titles in, in New Zealand, like Sir and all the rest of it, like you have here with, with Tun. And and people generally on a day-to-day -day basis wouldn't call you by your 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 title, um, sir, you know, uh, in normal day-to-day -day interactions. So people feel more egalitarian. What does that mean, apart from it's a more, uh, you know, apparently a more evil side. It means that if you see something um, being committed by somebody in authority or power, you're not afraid to speak up about it. And that's the whole premise around fighting corruption and what the ICAC did in Hong Kong. I remember growing up, um, all the publicity, the promotions, the adverts, which was all around this thing around, if you see something, you say something. I think HSBC's coined that phrase too. You know, If you see something, you say something and something get, uh, gets taken. Um, one of the things that I was very interested here was around motorcades, you know, of, of, of uh, I recall at the traffic lights in New Zealand sitting us alongside on more than one occasion, the prime minister stopped at the red light with me. He's not allowed to, or she, he it was he in those days, John Key, mm -hmm was not allowed to go through the red light with his motorcade. Okay, he's, why, why is he allowed to break the law? Albeit traffic law, okay? He's not fighting fires. He's not rushing to a bank robbery. He's not taking someone to hospital. So he had to, to wait in the, in the tra red light like, like everybody else. He couldn't exceed the, the, the speed limit. So that comes back to, uh, and uh, some people, uh, Mark's heard me say this before, um, around this issue around traffic. You know, and I remember talking to, Dr. Norazlan, who is the director of investigations for the MACC, a very, very experienced anti-corruption practitioner. And, and him and I were, were, were discussing it, and we agreed. He said he would know that Malaysia is on the path to really dealing with corruption when he saw people waiting at the red light. And what does that mean? If you look at corruption, or countries with, with lower levels of corruption, Singapore, Hong Kong, Norway, yeah, they have congestion, but they don't have the flagrant breaking of traffic laws because that's the basic law that we all obey on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we, we we drive, there's thousands of people that, if you don't obey that law, then it's easy not to obey the next law, okay? And also people then may not see enforcement taking place. You go out here, um, uh, you know, it, it, I know where I came from, in, if you saw a police officer not wearing a seatbelt, you take a photo of him, you send it to police, the police officer gets a ticket, okay? Um, you know, you, you see people here going through red lights. I've done, I do it myself, I'm not perfect, you know? They don't wear, they, they, they exceed the speed limit. My personal hate being an ex-police officer is seeing the number of children not restrained in the car, you know, not sitting in restrained car seats, not having seat belts on when that's so dangerous. But when you have that day-to-day -day breaking of, of the law, it's not difficult to break the next law. And then also, if there's that much break of law, then people will say, well, there's no enforcement. So if there's no enforcement there, it means there's no enforcement el elsewhere. So these are some of the simple things, because I think what we need to do is um, look at different ways of doing it. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to do the same thing. And I think it's Einstein's definition of insanity, do the same thing and hope, it, hope for a different outcome. So one of the things when, I, when I've looked at uh, some of the work that I've done is that Everyone likes a policy and procedure in Malaysia, okay? And we have the world's biggest policies and procedure. Well, who's going to read that, okay? If you want to fight corruption, shouldn't it be a nice, simple policy and procedure? If you look at, um, I think it's Airbus, after all the issues that they've had, they've come out with a global anti-corruption policy. It's eight pages long, okay? That's it, eight pages, simple to understand, very simple as for their entire global operations and not too many words. Some of the pages have only got half uh, of writing on it. Um, whistleblower policies. I, I see whistleblower policies 15, 20 pages long. You just need one page. Who's going to read that? You know, the, the, the whistleblower policy, which needs to be for the people on the ground level, the, 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 the very junior people to raise issues. Are they going to read a 20 page policy? No, they need one page. If you have an issue, you ring this number, you send an email here, you'll be protected. You can be anonymous. If you do it in good faith, nothing, but that's at one page, easy to un understand. Um, so I think we need to also look at things like uh, that. And finally, coming on to my also, my, my interesting thing is the no gift policy. I'm, I'm, I'm very much against personally a no gift policy. A lot of people have it. Well, no gifts, okay, we'll have no gifts that will solve corruption. 
Well, no, because you know, if I gave Mark, if it, Mark's company had no gift policy, I gave him a five ringgit pen because he was, you know, his pen ran out that day. He's broken it. Well, he may as well break it for the next gift policy. Uh, and I don't know, like I said, I come from just comparing because I was asked to compare with some of the things in New Zealand. I don't know any organization in New Zealand with a no gift policy. The police, you can give them a gift. It's all within a limit. Okay. I don't think Mark is going to, is going to, um, uh, uh, throw away his ethics if I gave him a $30 notebook. Okay, so it's things like that, so that that we need to, I think, look at reframing the question and looking at different ways of, of target. So we get to that position in society, whether it's in Malaysia or Indonesia or Australia. I know there's some Australians on the call, so I, I thought I'd throw that in. UK, wherever it may be, where if people see something, they feel empowered to say something, and that gets taken seriously. All right, Alex, I'm so sorry, I need to... No, that me finished. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, perfect timing. As soon as I saw you leaning towards the camera, I thought <laughs> that's my time as well. Okay, that's great. I'm glad that um, sometimes, you know, despite being virtual, the body language still shows up. So uh, thank you, Alex. That's really fascinating. Uh, I mean, I was quite intrigued by the last point about you know, uh, the no gifts policy thing, because many of us just assume uh, that these policies are there for a reason, but uh, I can see, uh, yeah, make, making a case for it. So I think They're what you're saying is- They're there to up space in a piece of paper, in many cases. <laughs> yeah, but the main point is that, focus. yeah, we, we need to reframe the question and what it is that we're actually targeting or trying to get rid of. Um, all right, next we move on quickly to Arna Deswaran, who was a journalist by training, a lawyer by qualification, and a crusader for good governance by choice. Um, many of us know him from his column in The Sun in the old days, and uh, he, has had, he has won numerous awards, uh, both Malaysian and international, breaking a lot of uh, stories. He's pioneered investigative reporting even back in the 1980s. Um, and today, he still continues to be very active. Um, he has retired actively from journalism in, in December 2016, but uh, still continues to write. And, and I think everyone knows Nadis from his investigative journalism work. So Nadis, please take the floor. Thank you, Trisha. Um, <clears throat> actually, I wanted to address a few issues uh, <clears throat> uh, raised by uh, Dr. Lee, but uh, I'm more interested in addressing uh, um, the question that has been raised uh, by fellow journalist from FMT. The question is, can panelists weigh in on whether corruption in procurement and inspection of foreign workers also directly or indir indirectly results in Malaysia's long-standing issue with unregulated uh, migrant workers? Is this especially detrimental throughout the pandemic now? <clears throat> the standing monument of arrogance, corruption, my indifference is lies in the construction industry. Make no bones about it. They are the biggest employers of undocumented un, uh, migrants. If you had read the newspapers yesterday or the day before, the Construction Industry Development Board is supposed to be the governing body, right? The construction industry comes out with a statement and says one out of three construction companies are not following SOPs. And it's a proud announcement, okay? The arrogance of them to announce that one third of their members are not complying with SOP. Now, isn't that the record in this country that you can boast about your achievements in breaking the law, not complying with the law? Now, this is a big question mark. Now, here comes the clincher. The construction industry also employs the largest number of undocumented workers, which means for each one, each undocumented worker, the government is deprived of 2,000 ringgit in revenue. Now you do a calculation and see, based on 1 million um, illegal construction workers times 2,000 per year levy, the government is being deprived of 2, million, 2 billion ringgit every year. If a construction project, say, takes three years, one project is uh, uh, 
over three years, it's six billion, right? How many hospitals can you build? How many schools can you build? You can do a lot of things. But this is it. The last time there was a crackdown on illegal immigrants, they ran and blackmailed the government. They said, if you arrest our illegal immigrants, our construction work will have to stop and everything else. So the government said, never mind, carry on employing the illegal immigrants. Now, is this the way to address the problem? Right? It's a sort of blackmail, which the government is just sub subjecting itself to. Look, <laughs> it's very clear, all construction, all workers have initially it was to be tested. How many of them did the test? Nobody has got statistics. Right? Each time an inspector comes around, or I've spoken to the big boss, it's okay. Now look at this announcement by CIDB. One in three construction companies are not complying with SOPs. What does that mean? What does that mean? If you have 1 million construction workers, 330,000 of them are not complying with SOPs. What is the response from the government? There's hardly been any response. There's no warning, please do it. Come on. While they found it necessary to declare EMCO in Slango Mansion and march out the people, why aren't they doing it in the construction industry? Again, it speaks of double standards, favoritism in enforcement of the law. Now, the question asks is, where does all this lead to? When you deprive a government of 2,000 ringgit workers money, paying 1,000 is 50% saving for the construction industry, right? So why isn't the industry, why isn't the, why aren't the authorities acting against uh, this, uh, such abnormalities, right? Is 1,000 enough to keep them quiet? Now, isn't that added cost to the cost of, of, uh, of goods? You work it in any way you want. But the construction industry is to be, to be blamed for all this. Right? Uh, you can um, talk about proper systems and all that, but the construction industry is not going to follow the systems. While everybody waits in turn for your plan to be approved and everything in the local government office, the contractor can jump over, over your head and walk ahead, and his, his application is on top of the of the of the of the pile when the OSC decides to discuss your building plans, right? A republic leader, the the local council come out and say we'll have a meeting calling for objections. How many, I don't I can't remember any any meeting where the the voice of the citizens were objected to to the development of the construction uh, has been taken into account and, and a planning application being rejected. Now, the system is such that government authorities, government agencies have fallen into this, 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 uh, or rather certain individuals have got into this, uh, I won't call it trap, but this incentive scheme, right? Uh, I, 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 I hope you remember, uh, city hall officer director was charged um, several counts of corruption. Unfortunately, the charges were withdrawn. But you see the power vested in one approval authority. I always, uh, when I talk about approvals, I'm always reminded of Lee Kuan Yew's book. When he said, never give power of discretion to anyone. If you have, if you have, if you have sent me uh, an application, if everything is in order, you should approve it. If there's a reason, you, you must give a reason why it is not approved. It's here, they can reject your application to build an awning to park your car in your porch without giving you any reasons, but they can yet approve multi-story complexes uh, despite you um, protesting about traffic and uh, environmental uh, problems. So there, here comes the issue. Money is a, is, is a great mover. It moves everything, especially I'm, I'm, I want to focus on the foreign workers problem. We have a problem on our hands. We've got a pandemic on our hands. They got to be uh, vaccinated and everything else. But then there are employees who said, we're making demands. 
please make sure they are not arrested. If you are illegal in this country, you deserve to be arrested. No two ways about it. Right? Why are you insisting we don't arrest them? How come they are illegals in the country? I'm not against uh, refugees and foreign workers, but I think if the time has come, this is a proper opportunity for the government to register and properly document them and collect the relevant fees. And the government needs the money very badly. A 2,000 a worker estimated that um, they say they, there is nobody, nobody, nobody got figures. According to MEF estimates, um, Malaysian Employer Federation, uh, they said there are 2.6 million foreign workers. So you multiply it by 2,000 per worker, you, you can collect 5.2 billion every year. It's buta money, as I call it. Having touched, having addressed that, uh, I hope I've answered your question, uh, Aina. Uh, I'd like to touch on what Dr. Lee had to say, right? On, on the medical uh, 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 procurement system. Now, <clears throat> we all know now, we all know as, as, as policy, even if I do not know which end of the stethoscope I got to put in my ear, I can still tender or be a supplier to the Ministry of Health because of the NEP and the Bumi Putra policy. Now, even if people, are, uh, people who do not know which end of the stethoscope goes into the year are supplying operating systems to the hospitals. This is a sad state of affairs, right? That is why when, you, when autoclaves and everything break down, there's no after sales service. The guy who's selling to you says, you take, I've sold my product, I've collected my money. Mr. Ahmad has collected his commission, but the machine lies idle. How many cases I think Dr. Lee will tell you about machines are not serviced, not repaired in government hospitals. So this is a major, major problem on the procurement system. It all comes back again. If you want to be, uh, divert savings from corruption, to the public. Okay, now they're sorry. Um, you have to wrap up. Okay, I just want to, just want to add, add, add this. The, the only thing is having a transparent, open procurement system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, we have done a lot of work on procurement, and uh, I also I strongly believe addressing procurement is also at the heart of uh, addressing many of the things that we've talked about in the report, um, the tender process, construction, and so on. Uh, yeah, I, I know you commented on migrant workers. I think this, this is a multifactorial issue and um, I don't mean to take too much time from the other panelists, but it's, it is a complex uh, environment and you know, the term that, that academics usually refer to would be undocumented as opposed to illegal because it's, it's a combination of factors, not just from the workers themselves, it's the it's the employers um, that are involved. Uh, there are syndicates that are involved. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I would say that there are multiple culprits in this particular problem. And we can spend an hour talking about that. So uh, I won't go into that. I just want to go to the next speaker. So Johnson Chong is um, a member of the core team at Rasua Busters. He is an education consultant and social entrepreneur. And uh, he has more than 10 years of experience in the Malaysian political arena, um, now working at Raswa Busters to build the nation and engaging the Rakyat through a coalition of willing at every level. Community, Johnson, over to you. Uh, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Um, now you can see my screen, right? Yes. I hope this will help me keep on track. Uh, again, Salamat Sejahtera to everyone and good morning. Um, I noticed that we are already at the end of the panelist hour, but I'll try to um, reduce the time on what I've got here. Now, I'm going to take a slightly different take. And as, as, as you can see, I'm focusing on education. Uh, not only do I have 10 years experience in politics, I also have close to 10 years experience in education. 
And so I'm going to um, focus more on education and um, have a more macro point of view. And this is coming from parts of it is from me personally, and parts of it is from uh, Russell Buster's perspective. Now, we are talking about corruption because we are concerned about the impact it has on people and society, right? So I've got a question. What if society itself as a whole is threatened by a larger, more destructive phenomenon? Wouldn't we want to talk about that and corruption in that context? Now, so I, I hope um, you all are not expecting answers from this. I probably will create more questions than answers. Um, but I've got three main points. Unfortunately, they're broken down into more points. Um, but the three points I want to address are the everyday corruption thing that you're talking about in uh, the report. And to me, I think one thing that's very important to recognize is that it is a symptom. It is not the disease itself. And although what I'm going to talk about in terms of corruption may not be something that uh, so-called happens every day, but it has an everyday impact on people, okay? Uh, number two, um, I'm very glad that uh, ideas in your report, you've um, used Amundsen's uh, sort of list of forms of corruption, and one of them is favoritism. And to me, um, this, this gives me the sort of framework to address what I would like to address in a macro point of view. Okay, and I'm talking about education particularly because it has very deep implications across the board, right? Although some of the things that I mentioned will be relevant to, to the other sectors like construction and health, but I believe education goes even deeper. Okay, and lastly, how do we solve this problem? Like Alex was saying, you know, uh, the definition of insanity by Einstein is we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So maybe it's time we looked at things differently, right? Now, um, so just now I said corruption is a symptom, not the disease itself. And here I would like to just mention that um, I'm very happy to see on the Coalition for Business Integrity um, one of the key points on the website is, is this. Greed should not be an element in the pursuit of, uh, of profitability. And I think that's excellent because to me, the, the disease is the moral decay in, in society and not just to me, to rough sound busters as well. And this, I believe the real cause is um, is the fact that we believe, we have the mistaken belief that the pursuit of material gains is what produces real wealth. And, and that is a big problem uh, because in light of the current situation, if I could just share a, a definition of wealth by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Now here, you can read it for yourself, right? His definition, but I just want to focus on the key points. It is our collective capability, that's number one. With the environment, that's number two. Sustaining a healthy regeneration, number three, of physical and metaphysical aspects, yeah? And it is forward-looking, future-oriented. Now, in light of the environmental crisis, and even the threat of mass extinction, which is way beyond this, this webinar scope. But that's something out there that I think we need to bear in mind if we're talking about the threat of corruption to society and people's uh, livelihoods. But what if there isn't even going to be a society to live in? So to me, this is relevant. And so going back to the previous slide, I just want to say that we need to be aware of what we are actually dealing with before we can make changes, right? It's, it might seem a bit um, basic here, but I think that's, that's quite critical. Now, 
Um, moving on to, to um, favoritism. So I'm glad that um, favoritism is one of the, the forms of corruption here that's mentioned. Now, I mean, I don't want to dwell into the normal, the so-called expected uh, forms of uh, corruption in education where you pass students despite failing results, um, we, where the government is using a substandard online system for schools and paid millions for it, or not providing quality programs to students because no bribe was given to the right department. And to, since I'm giving examples, one of the, the shock, most shocking one that I can think of, or someone has told me is that teachers actually pay a substantial pride to secure a position as a principal of a school so that they can enjoy kickbacks later on by giving out contracts for the school. Now that's, that's shocking. But I think to me, um, favoritism is, is something we need to look at and I'm gonna stretch the definition a bit uh, bigger than what it is already is, yeah. Number one, at the simplest level, um, we are talking about favoring friends. Right. So just, just think about it. In the last 10 years, how many new universities or university colleges have there been, uh, you know, sprouting around Malaysia? Right. And just ask yourself, how many of these were the government of the day favoring friends and family? So that's cronism and nepotism. That's clear cut. Right. Now, the next point that I want to make is, what about favoring a privatization model to provide a public good? Now, here, let me just share um, the cost of education. Is, is, the, is it big enough, the, the figures? I hope so. Anyway, you can see from this table that the top three, supposedly top three, because there's a lot of ties there, uh, is actually top six. The education is actually free in their respective countries, right? Denmark, New Zealand, Finland, Switzerland, Singapore, Sweden. And then once we get down to Malaysia, which is ranked 57 downwards, you'll see that education, even in public universities, have to be paid for. Right? China has a unique scholarship uh, system. Uh, but of course, to be fair, if you look at the, the uh, population size, there, is certain there are certain reasons why you know, countries like Denmark, New Zealand, or Singapore can offer uh, free education. But then again, we've got to ask ourselves, why is society structured the way it's structured that we have to pay for a public good depriving um, citizens children of a decent quality education simply because their families did not you know uh, does not have the the ability to afford a decent education now um so how else are we paying for it? I think this, on this point, the thing is when we have corruption at such a high level throughout the country, especially in education, it ends up that the government is not giving all the resources necessary for the capitalization of our human resources. So our our people are not developed as much as they could have been. And therefore, Malaysia is not as competitive as it could be in the world. So again, coming back to this table, I've actually put there the world competitive ranking, competitiveness ranking, right? Malaysia is at 25. Whereas you can see the countries that rank very high on the CPI are uh, 11 and above. The anomalies here are New Zealand and South Africa, right? 
Okay, so those, those are some numbers there, some, some food for thought, yeah? Yeah, moving on. So I just want to jump into the solution part. I think that's what we all really want, isn't it? And I think as, as um, Dr. Lee mentioned at the end of his presentation, he said, the problem is systemic. And I completely agree. The problem in the education uh, sector is also systemic. And so our, our solution needs to be holistic, isn't it? Uh, let me use an analogy uh, to show that why this affects the whole country, if not the whole world. And, and that analogy is agriculture and the environment as a whole. When we have this reductionist mindset, this reductionist materialist. Can wrap up as well, yep, sorry. Yep, yeah, this will be my last slide. Thanks, Tricia. We are actually destroying the soil and the whole ecosystem and thereby destroying the environment, right? Uh, but if we looked at the whole ecosystem and worked with it, then everybody benefits. Similarly, in, in education, now more often than not, everybody is just looking at academics, at formal education, when in fact education, a lot of the key parts of it is actually outside the classroom, outside uh, the formal part of it, as in right now, if you, you just Google what are 21st century skills, you find creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and these things are mostly not th taught in classrooms. They are picked up by students, by children, from their parents, from you know, interaction with other people, so on and so forth. Now, one of the biggest problems, I think, or one of the biggest challenges is that Education has now come to a point where it is hyper specializing. For example, we even have a bachelor's degree, a bachelor's of business degree in event management. What is that? Do we seriously need a whole degree just to learn how to do event management? In any case, people that you know, uh, progress or achieve high uh, success in the careers tend more to be generalists rather than specialists. I'll just give you an example. Somebody who's listed as the top 50 intellects in the world, Kisho Mabubani, a Singaporean, right? A career diplomat. But now he is much more than that. He's a successful author, he's a speaker, he's a professor. So I, I seriously think we need to look at things holistically. We need to go back to the drawing board, design and develop the solution in partnership, both private, public, you know, perhaps having decentralized networks, um, you know, based on scientific principles and values. And I must say, and this is why I picked, apart from the fact that I'm, I, I was in education all these years, is that education itself is part of the solution. And to me, actually, I, my background is also in law like uh, Nadis, right? And human rights law for that matter. But I can tell you this, the best regulator of human behavior are not laws, they are values. So I think in terms of the report, perhaps this is something that, um, that should be addressed. You know, not just having more laws, more regulations, but what about the whole system, the culture, the whole, uh, ecosystem. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. I hope uh, they will thank you very much. generate thank you. some discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Johnson. Thanks for preparing a PowerPoint presentation as well uh, for this talk. Uh, I must say that we are running very, very late. Um, if you could also stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Your, uh, Sorry. Yeah. Ben. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I want to invite the final panelists, but I also want to give the heads up to everyone here, uh, panelists as well as attendees that uh, we will probably run beyond 12 p.m., uh, 12 noon, if that is all right, uh, maybe about maybe 15 to 20 minutes extra so that there's a little bit of time to address questions. If I may ask as well, anyone who has a question, please don't put it in the chat box, uh, put it in the, in the Q&A box. And if the panelists want to already try to start answering some of the questions, I think uh, you can do that simultaneously. But 
Now, I'd like to, uh, last but not least, invite Dr. Haji Mazlan Haji Ahmad, the Deputy President of Malaysia Corruption Watch, um, and he's also a member of the MACC Operations Review Panel. Uh, Dr. Haji Mazlan is the founder of Mashi Group of Companies, which operates in a few countries. So he's in the private sector, um, in, in sectors such as construction and development, property, food and tourism, finance and banking, hotel products and services, management and advisory services. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience in the banking industry as well, um, has held positions in the Central Bank of Malaysia and has uh, advisory services so that no parties will be victimized into financial crime, whether in the form of bribery, external or internal fraud. Um, he is a founding member of the Malaysian Corruption Watch. Uh, I think he's actually not present in the screen at the moment. So I'll pass the time immediately to him when he does return. But maybe um, there are a lot of questions flowing in already. So I want to ask one question, which was a short one by Sean Chia. And I think this might be uh, interesting. So how much is the impact of affirmative action policies instead of meritocracy, um, the root cause of corruption? And maybe for this, I can um, address to um, YB, Dr. Lee Boon Chai, as well as if, if you're also there, there's another question here specific to health. Um, can any parallels be drawn between the pharma industry um, with regards to corruption here in Malaysia and the actions of the opioid uh, manufacturers in the US who have legally challenged their role in the epidemic there? So. Um, the question on affirmative action and then also just on the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, thank you, Tisha. I think there are many questions also been raised by other panelists as well, apart from these two about Bumiputra policy and uh, the opiate uh, industry. I don't have much understanding about the opiate industry in, in US, so I probably reserve my comment. But I think uh, overall, I do agree with uh, Johnson about uh, what is the best way to curb corruption is not about law, it's about value. I think the day where what Milton Friedman said about greed is good, which has been <laughs> running the capital system for the past, how many, 20, 30 years. I think we should have, we must have a, a proper review of this uh, thinking about greed is good, where you can see that, you know, achievement of individual is measured by how much wealth they have accumulated. So that's one part. The other thing is we have uh, gone through so many discussions, but one obvious thing which we have not touched on, the elephant in the room, is actually corruption by political leaders. Because we have a political patronage which is well in, entrenched. And because there's a need for funding to fund political position, so, so inevitably, there will be need for political funding and at the end, uh, this contribute to rampant corruption. I think some were mentioned about whether building hospital when the hospital was delayed and not completed, is it constitute corruption or incompetency? But it's corruption because behind the awards of the contracts, a lot of the contracts are awarded based on political patronage and not because based on competency and value for money of the contractor. So I think this is an aspect we've got to address. And also, uh, but I also look at other systems. I think Capitol Hill is also heavily corrupted. Uh, they can make things easier by legalizing corruption, by legalizing lobby group, by if, take for example, when Donald Trump appointed Ivanka Trump and uh, uh, Jared Krishna, uh, Krishna as his personal advisor, if it were to be done in Malaysia, that would be, uh, will be heavily criticized for corruption. But that's expected of what is happening in America. So I think coming back to Bumi Putra policy, to me, I don't have a big problem with Bumi Putra policy. I think we have inequality uh, along racial line, which has to be addressed. But the way we address it, we got to be a better way of addressing. The problem we had now is actually we don't pick competent Bumiputra to run the project. We pick Bumiputra who support the political leadership. That's a problem. And we had a lot of contractors who come and go 
because the political leader come and go. So those contractors, they never pick up or they never build competency and skill and knowledge in their field. The only thing they had is how to get the contract. They are not good at building hospitals, good at building clinics, but they are good at getting contract. Uh, that's their key competency. So that's where we had a lot of failure in this aspect. And we really need to review this. i give you another example about drug procurement, uh, which was raised earlier on. There's this program, Ana Angkat. Ana Angkat is to have Bumiputra uh, players in the pharma industry. And, and of course, they are given privileged position to get, uh, to get contracts to supply medication to the Ministry of Health. But after three years, they are still anangkat. After five years, they are still anangkat. After 10, 20 years, they are still anangkat. I always joke to my fellow uh, ministry fellow, they are no more anangkat. They are already bapa angkat. Bapa, even when they are bapa angkat, they will still enjoy the privilege. And this is where the system is wrong. You need to siphon out competent contractor who can do the job. And I'm sure there are a lot of competent Bumi Putra contractor who can do better jobs. And, uh, and certainly that uh, can be done. And the other thing is about FOMEMA, uh, which have been raised. Uh, I think, first of all, the award of FOMEMA as a monopoly, I think is wrong. It was done many, many years ago, even to name's time. It was wrong. And, uh, and until now, he maintains the monopoly. It is grossly wrong when the monopoly is maintained. But the process of health screening for foreign worker, I must give them the credit, is done extremely well. I think they've done a good job, but I think maintaining the mon monopoly uh, should be stopped. I think lastly, just a few things which I want to touch on is what are things which we could do better? Number one, what has been said is a negative and positive list. A negative list is what you cannot do. If you do, you'll be punished. A positive list is mainly for government servant. When people are submitting everything for approval, you must approve without question. If you don't approve, you need to state the reason. The second thing is, if you want to build a culture of anti-corruption environment, then you need a 360 degree of reporting, meaning that the top report the bottom, the subordinate also report the superior, and the client can report government officer and vice versa. And it should be taken upon as a responsibility, express responsibility to report the 360 degree reporting. And lastly, we need to overhaul the audit system because the audit, what gets measured gets done. The auditing system is auditing the process. They don't audit the outcome. The process is easily rigged. I can tell you 101 ways of rigging the process how to submit tender document, how to make sure you got three tender, things like this. They all are, all these process are easily rigged. I think the audit system has to be revamped and they should audit outcome rather than just process. I think that's some of my response. All right. If there's Thank anything, you. I'll be glad to answer. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, YB Dr. Lee Boon Chai. Uh, so now we're switching back from the Q&A uh, session back to the panel. So apologize because earlier, I think Dr. Haji Mazlan stepped out. So Dr. Haji Mazlan Ahmad, um, Deputy President from Malaysia Corruption Watch and member of MEPC Operations Review Panel. Um, I've already uh, talked a little bit about your background earlier. So maybe Dr. Haji, please, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for agreeing to uh, come and speak today. Uh, you're on mute, Doctor. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you, Trisha, for inviting me to share some thoughts on the launching of production and supply chains, forms and impact on consumers. 
So what I'm going to do uh, within these seven minutes is basically to share my personal experience, not only as a member of PPO, but also uh, my past experience where I used to be head of uh, enforcement with Central Bank of Malaysia. Now, uh, the overview of MACC, uh, basically we are doing our level best to make sure that corruption is really deal uh, at the bottom level. That means whenever we feel there is some small even spark of fire about corruption, we will deal it directly. So the whole intent and purpose with our MACC is basically we would like to disrupt and dismantle uh, criminal enterprises ranging from corruption, abuse of power, favoritism, conflict of interest, so on and so forth. But what is more important today is that I would like everybody to understand. Uh, in the past, we only tackle the receiver, the receiver of the corruption. And today, we understand also we need to equally recognize that one of the contributions to the uh, increase the numbers of corruption in Malaysia is because of the numbers of giver. So under the law, it's very clear, both receiver and uh, giver are liable. And of course, in the past, we are only emphasized on the receiver, which is in our case, we are talking about public servant receiver law of corruption. But we forget that the mother of, of the corruption will not happen if there is no giver. Uh, if you understand the ecosystem in terms of financial, the receiver is only received not even 5% from the total benefits that generated from this uh, corruption activity, but 95% actually goes back to the giver. So if you understand this ecosystem, then this is the best way to really handle and manage all the corruption activities in Malaysia. And there's one thing, that's the reason why also we introduced Section 17, Capital A, right? So this is very, uh, we have several cases already charged in court, and we hope that more and more people, more and more uh, commercial sector understand about these uh, provisions. Uh, of course, this is very serious. Uh, to me, uh, as one of the uh, members, I can see a lot of corporates now, they are really engaging consultant. They really go through and they will make sure that at the board levels, the management levels, uh, they are fully understand about what is adequate measures all about. So this is very good movement. So I would say uh, in the future, with all these uh, measures uh, adequate, uh, implemented widely uh, nationwide, uh, I would say the numbers of corruption should be reduced further. That is on my overview. Of course, uh, on MACC, we have our own technical team to deal with uh, corruption. Highly technical. We have our computer forensics, we have financial forensics, we have many specialized teams to really handle uh, technically uh, with regard to this corruption activity. Uh, our process is getting better and better. We have technology, we have used our I2, we use all our latest advanced uh, tools and techniques so that it will facilitate and help us to make sure that we can uh, arrest all these perpetrators uh, in a more effective way. And on the segment report uh, pertaining to construction, education, healthcare, yes, I must say we take it seriously. Uh, yes, the numbers getting more and more with regard to construction, education, and healthcare. Uh, but what we do, basically, uh, we proactively, uh, instead of waiting for the complaint received, what we do on our side, uh, we have identified red flags. So we have our own red flags with regard to construction, education, healthcare industry. Uh, if you uh, follow in the, in the past, uh, there are several cases with regard to this construction, education, and healthcare. And I fully agree with your finding because all these corruptions it create unnecessary additional cost to the consumer. Uh, because of this corruption activity, now when we are talking about construction, education, healthcare, we get product services which is substandard. Not only is higher than what we are supposed to get, but the quality is substandard. And at the same time, we receive a lot of complaints where all these products, some of some of it is basically a fake product. It is very, very serious matters. Fake product uh, without uh, approval from various uh, uh, agency. Uh, of course, it involves a lot of frauds. Talking about fraud, I can see uh, some involve 
internal and external frauds. So this way, when we talk about uh, how we can combat uh, uh, corruptions in Malaysia, one of the uh, strategy that we use is basically we collaborate with various uh, parties so that first they themselves must create internally a whistleblower team, whistleblower blowing policy. So whenever they see there's some uh, fire out there, they can immediately uh, inform the, uh, uh, the, the uh, information to the relevant agency. So hopefully by having this whistleblowing policy, uh, we can uh, immediately disrupt and put down the fire before it becomes bigger and difficult to handle. Uh, of course, we can understand a, a lot of uh, irresponsible operators. Uh, they take advantage because of the sentiment, you know, uh, sometimes even the consumer, they don't bother whether they receive fake products, subsetter product. So this way we create a lot of uh, connection with consumerism, you know, so that they understand what is right that they should. Uh, exercise as a consumer. Uh, talking about adequate measures, uh, we are also looking from a lifestyle perspective. So we want to make sure that all our consumers get the best lifestyle, not the substandard, not the low quality. So what we do is basically we get a lot of awareness in MACC. We have our own program, uh, program with university, program with corporate, program with government sectors. Uh, even we have a program with uh, individual consumer, they can come and understand what is their right. And one of the things that uh, I would like to highlight is, is that uh, because of this corruption is also part and parcel of predicate offense under anti-money laundering. So uh, most of the cases we uh, simultaneously uh, open the uh, investigation paper using the provision under anti-money laundering. So we can see uh, once we use our anti-money laundering, the impact is huge and we can see uh, the perpetrators will think twice before engaging themselves with corruption So they know uh, under the law is very clear we can freeze the account we can seize and eventually we can even forfeit the, the account or assets that derive from this uh, corruption activity and the third portion on the strategic collaboration with private sector and civil society so this is where we always encourage uh, at the uh, NGO levels to create their own uh, movement, basically to work hand in hand with the government to combat the corruption. So uh, I can talk about Malaysian Corruptions uh, Wash, MCW, where currently I'm one of the uh, deputy president. So we use our NGO platform to really uh, combat uh, at the national level. We are talking about not only creating awareness, we are also become the eyes and ears and also the spokesperson for the uh, SPRM. So this worked very effectively. And we also managed to help to uh, net some of the potential perpetrators, uh, you know. So uh, last but not least, uh, what is more important is that um, we need to have a good education system. We need to create awareness. Which program must be uh, improved and make it like a compulsory. So whoever that you know would like to become even a, a member of parliament, they must go through a certain uh, integrity process to do some check and balance. And one of the root cause why all this conflict of interest uh, happened because of lack of transparency. So this is where, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, even company for that matter, it's okay for them to buy or get the tender from their associate company but it must be declared during the board, during the tender process. So when you declare, no more speculation, so that it eventually will give benefits not only to the company, but also to, to the consumer. Two things, manage the conflict of interest. Secondly, make it uh, transparent. And uh, last but not least, uh, what I would like to uh, say is that the integrity, if only everyone exercise the integrity value in our lifestyle, in our family, in our corporate, in our, you know, constitutions, chances are the uh, corruption will be minimized and we will have a better lifestyle. So uh, corruption fighting is not only uh, under or lies with government per se, but we as a public, we as NGO, we as a corporate, we need work hand in hand and support. Uh, let us uh, target that uh, in 2030, 
uh, we can minimize to the zero level of corruption because corruption is the, really the mother of all crimes in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haji Mazlan. Um, okay, I, can, I, can I ask the Dr. Mazlan a question? Uh, yes. Sure, maybe um, let me ask one and then you can ask one and then Dr. Mazlan can answer. So um, I think, you know, earlier on we talked about, before you arrived, uh, about impact on public health care. And uh, YB Dr. Lee Boon Chai was talking about how there's very severe problem of hospital cost overruns. Um, in fact, he said that the cost of public hospitals, constructing public hospitals, um, is sometimes 100% more than the private hospitals. So I'm just wondering whether, based on your experience in MACC, um, what, what happens and what is the recourse there? Because certainly, uh, if, if the numbers actually reveal themselves, then there has to be a party that is held responsible. Um, do, you, do we normally wait for such a lot of complaint or uh, a lot of a, of, of a report to be made before this can actually be investigated? Because I think for hospitals, I mean, this really has a severe impact on the consumers. I mean, you and I will actually be affected. Uh, so, and then Nadis wants to ask a question as well. So please go ahead, Nadis. Uh, Dr. Mazlan, uh, also, a um, lot of uh, former civil servants, KSUs, uh, uh, retired um, enforcement officers become directors of uh, companies that are supplying goods and services to the government. Right? This is I, it's a, it's a kind of influence buying. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, last month or the month before, the KSU of uh, the Ministry of Health retired, right? Hardly had the ink dried on his uh, retirement papers. He was appointed to the board of KLK company, a company called KLK, which is a supplier of medical equipment to the government. KLK supplies hospital beds and everything else. Now, would this amount of influence spending, as in your case, you are a bank Negara officer, right? Now you're sitting on other companies. Wouldn't you as a layman, wouldn't you be peddling influence, your influence on behalf of your company to your former mates in Bank Negara or any other agency that you are dealing with, right? Therefore, my question, my question is, how are you going to stop this influence peddling by retired civil servants and those with connections with the government? All right, thank you, Nadis. Um, Dr. Mazlan, uh, feel free to answer those two questions. So one from me and then one from Nadis and then um, after this, uh, what I'll do is because we are, you know, we've had many panelists and lots of questions. Um, after Dr. Mazan answers this question, I will go around uh, all the questions and then I think I'll give an opportunity for all the panelists to answer those questions that I've raised um, as well as provide like some of their closing thoughts. So uh, I wish we had more time to do more interaction because it's a very important question, but also the subject covers a very, very wide span of topics. Uh, we could do several series of discussions on it. So Dr. Mazdan, please. Okay, this is where I just want to highlight to you. Um, there are several roles played by various uh, institutions of various check and balance entities. So I'm talking about the gatekeeper's role. So we have, we, if we are talking about gatekeeper's role, there are three basically functions. One, we are talking about risk management. So any project will not get through until and unless they have been filtered by this, the so-called risk management. So risk management, we are talking about cost, we are talking about budget, we are talking about development, construction, we are talking about insurance covers on so forth. So we have one check and balance played by risk management. Second, we have another check and balance played by compliance side. So we have a compliance officer to make sure everything above the law, everything transparent, everything subject to various rules, regulations. The third is also the roles of internal audit. So internal audit doesn't mean... Hey, Mantan, you're not answering my question. Yeah, yeah. Specifically the... I'm asking. No, I'm not answering for three uh, seconds. Nadez, I think Dr. Mazdan's replying to me first. Okay. 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 So uh, these are the three. In front, we have get first, we have clients, we have what we call internal audit. Of course, we have external audits. So basically, we can detect anything even before the project start, right? That's why we have a tender process on because we have all the tools is there. Now, 
what happened some of the hospital the budget is only 500 million and suddenly it costs overrun double what happened because of risk management compliance audit and stuff audit of course one of the role because of the project management consultant they are not playing the part and as far as MACC, macc is concerned we have our own team that have access to see whether that project is justified to ask for additional or variation costs. So uh, I remember there's one case somewhere in one of the state. Uh, initially, it's only 500 million, but suddenly it costs double than what is expected. So what happened is that uh, this is where the real corruptions come in because of the layer. The layer, what I'm talking about here, it's involved financial institutions, involved the staff, the CEO, of course, in, involved with the authority who approved that budget. And then because of that also, now it is under investigation. And even we also investigate the financial institution. Of course, we also investigate who provide authority. So I totally agree because it is done to me. It's not worth for us to get involved with any corruption activity because sooner or later, authority will come after you. Okay, so generally, uh, if I may again to sum up with this uh, concern is that yes, we fully aware what happened because everything is on paper. If the project is budgeted with 500 million, it can go various, but with justifiable uh, process that need to be undertaken. And for uh, Nadesh, um, yes, I, I totally agree with you, but you just imagine, um, who knows better on the banking industry, if not the regulator, that done with the policy making projection for the next 30 years, how the industry should look like. And now they're coming up from the industry, from the regulator roles. I mean, we are talking about government. Now suddenly he is in the industry. So on one Thought. I would say that he's the right person because he knows what he wants to do for the industry. He understands the policy. And more important than anything else, he understands about rules and regulation, what can be done and what cannot be done. Of course, there are some elements of conflict of interest, right? Because he in the past approved the project and suddenly now he's one of the industry players. Sounds like definitely there will be element of uh, conflict of interest. But to me, whether there is any conflict of interest is very easy. We just normal conduct our asset test. Yes, now, whether what benefit do you derive from all new decisions that you make hereafter? If yes, you only, because of you know all the uh, junior senior officer in the government agency that provide the authority because of your relationship, formerly you were their bosses. Now they have to follow whatever you, your request. I think it's very unfair if we uh, make it that kind of conclusion. Because whatever that he would like to propose to the government, they have to follow the same procedure. Uh, this is where uh, I'm very happy to, to, to share with you. Uh, we also work closely with uh, MYCC, Malaysia Anti Competition Commissions. Uh, a lot of companies uh, that provide construction, education, healthcare, they are also doing some big rigging. So anything that you cannot prove under MACC, that's where you are more than happy to pass to MYCC. So MYCC, they will definitely net those guys that previously working on behalf of the government. So you cannot run away. Uh, to me, again, can we prove there is element of conflict of interest? And can we confirm that everything is already transparently declared during the meeting? If they are not doing these two things, definitely they will, in, will be in our radar. So uh, again, I would, take, I would like to take this opportunity if you have any information pertaining all these uh, uh, irregularities, not corruptions activity, just you can let me know. Or you can just uh, convey to our websites. Our, we have our own uh, mobile. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make one correction. Um, the case you have mentioned, Dr. Chan So Min, uh, join LKL International, right? Yeah. But uh, less than a month, he quit as chairman of the board. Uh, uh, he was executive chairman. That means he had executive powers. I don't know whether it was because of public pressure or anything. He quit, to be honest, after 28 days, 
he resigned. But the whole issue comes back to this. How do you stop uh, Dr. Mazlan or generally to like uh, YB Dr. Lee and other panelists, uh, Alex and all that. How do you stop this influence paddling by installing these people as directors and, and consultants and everything else? Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Nades. I think the point is clear. I think, um, I mean, conflict of interest is what is key here. And Dr. Mazan mentioned conflict of interest, but I, I'm also curious to know how our government, uh, including MACC, like what is their measurement of conflict of interest? Um, and also what are the punitive measures, right? So if the conflict of interest is not declared, because in, in some of the countries that I visited, so I went to visit uh, the enforcement, I think in France, uh, they actually measure what conflict of interest is by law. So that they give a definition, they give a shape to it. Whereas I think in Malaysia, we, we don't have that quite uh, based on what I understand. So maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong in, in your closing remarks. Um, a lot of these things are vague, but the point is that it can be systematic. It can be measured. It can be defined, given a shape and form, and therefore some punitive measures attached to it as well. Um, there's a lot of questions, and uh, thank you to the panelists for answering some of them already. If I can ask um, all the panelists to come back on and turn their videos on, um, I'm going to verbally talk about a few. And then after that, uh, I will invite each of you to provide your uh, responses as well as a closing remark. So um, there's a couple of very good questions from Chu Sunny. So how effective would corporate governance be in breaking the element of corruption in, in the supply chain? Um, the audit committee's role as a deterrent would clearer SOPs as a way forward deter corruption. Um, bypassing the SOPs by exercising discretionary authority and the mid-management role of detecting discrepancy and channeling reports directly to the audit committee. So again, these are all about processes and procedures. Um, maybe Alex could attempt answering that particular question. Uh, I want to go to a question on the MACC's independence. So is it independent enough? Does it have the adequate authority to directly tackle systemic bribery issues um, led by politicians in power? And I'm glad that uh, YB Dr. Lee mentioned political leadership corruption because uh, this is not something that we investigated here in the report, but IDEAS is separately doing work on political funding or political financing um, and trying to unpack the very convoluted process of how the source of systemic corruption can actually be traced back to uh, political funding. Uh, finally, Dr. Loy asks that Dr. Mazdan, should we adopt South Korean's Corruption Investigation Office for high-ranking officials? This an agency can investigate the president, members of the National Assembly, public prosecutors, judges, and their family members for any misconduct. Uh, so whether or not we should adopt that. Um, there are many other questions here. We can't get through to all of them, but I will invite uh, all the speakers, perhaps in backwards order, uh, to respond to the questions, but also provide any closing thoughts. And uh, I will also invite, uh, apart from our panelists, uh, Uni, my colleague Sri Munyati, to give uh, comments and as well as Mark. So uh, all of you have very short, can I say only three minutes for you to respond because it's already 12.19. So let's bring it all the way to 12.30 and put a hard stop at 12.30. Uh, so Dr. Mazlan, uh, we'll start with you first and then we'll go backwards. Okay, uh, let me share my own personal experience. When I was with Bank Negara, uh, when we see a lot of uh, money flowing up from the country, when we see a lot of uh, tax revenue that supposed to be collected by the government, it's not collected, then we form a special task force. And arising from this finding on this special task force, we found out that yes, our government situation, our economy is very bad. So therefore, what we do is that we propose, because of the element of political corruptions that you uh, correctly mentioned, so we propose to the government then is to set up political funding act. So when we discuss with all the political party, 
all party do not agree except only the government at that time which is at that time is under Barisan Nasional and you can google at that time Datuk Sri Najib mentioned okay now Barisan Nasional agree to have a political funding act so that everything money coming in and coming up will be openly declared accountable for so the rest of other party reject outright no we we must not declare our political fund all our sources and our application okay now uh, what i'm trying to relate is, is that macc we propose to the government to have a political fund only one party except at the time is the government of barisan nasional the rest of the party rejected outright and then the best part with or without the new suggestion like using the korea law even the current macc law also we have charged the number one the datuk sri najib right that mean uh, we can charge anybody without fear and favor and is already orchestrated and we already showcased that we have successfully charged datuk sri najib is the only one person promote that we need to have a political fund act and he is also the first person that we charge for infringing uh, that political fund that mean which is we do not uh, favor or bias to any party uh, that is the first secondly whether we have adequate measures i would say yes now we are using all the tools we are using all our channel that's why uh, our intelligence team uh, you may not know that actually there are uh, among you guys in your own uh, working environment in your own organization they are basically working for us on behalf of us they are basically to share their ears their eyes on our behalf they also the spoke person and of course i mentioned about the movement of ngo so a lot of ngo are actually become the eyes and ears of uh, mbcc if you look at the numbers of uh, mbcc officer there is no way the mbcc officer can cover the entire nations but because of we are working smart as strategic collaboration we work with all other ngos we will welcome public we welcome uh, private sector uh, to to be part of uh, our combating the corruption as number one enemy yeah all i right. think uh, i think uh, my 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 closing remark is basically uh, you are more than happy to receive any feedback suggestion on how we can move forward and improve our services to the government and of course to the nation Thank you so much, Dr. Mazdan. Uh, we would love to interact with you more. I'm happy that you've opened that door and that channel for us. Um, Johnson, please. Uh, okay, so I think I will still return to my main point at the end that we need a holistic approach to it. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about adopting the South Korean model, or which I agree with uh, Dr. Haji that, I mean, our current laws already allow us to go after whoever. We don't need more special laws, more special procedures. At the end of the day, with even the best laws already legislated, if we do not have people with the right mindset, with the right values to implement these laws, to execute uh, these laws, to enforce them, it still will end up with square one. So, I mean, um, Take a look at China. They do, uh, you know, have capital punishment for corruption. Does it really stop um, people from, you know, um, doing those things? Not really. But I mean, but now because there is really solid uh, leadership under, you know, the current uh, leader, you find that they are actually talking more about values to try and both long term and short term enforce. Right, go after those who are corrupt and also institute or try to instill the right kinds of values throughout society. So I think we need that overarching approach to it. So not to belabor the point. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Johnson. Uh, if I may just quick respond to that, quickly mm -hmm. respond. Uh, I agree that values are important. Uh, I think the problem is that there's only so much when you instill the values in our children, but if they observe that the leaders behave in ways otherwise, and yet, and yet get rewarded for it, um, what does that what does that do for the, the value 
system. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Can I just very quickly okay. uh, respond to that, Tricia? Thank you very much for raising that point. I, and I was just rushing just now and I sure. couldn't address this point. Actually, I wanted everyone to ask themselves this question. Who is responsible for education? Even the way education is structured, it is so favored towards the, number one, the official system. It is also uh, sort of dictated by the dominant industries. What is the content of the education? But in reality, a lot of the values that are inculcated in our children comes from the parents. And if parents don't behave in a way with integrity, like Dr. Haji Maslan was saying this now, so you can forget about whole generations of, of, of uh, children growing up. You can forget about having values, right? Thanks. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, so all the parents here, we have to wake up. Well, I think if not, we, if not already knowing it. All right, Nadeswar, please. Sorry, um, I was so focused on supply chain. Um, yes, that is the topic of discussion today. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Everybody talked about anything else. For me, uh, I, 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 I just like to, you know, perhaps uh, Alex can later elaborate. Our answer to all our woes is one simple amendment to the MACC Act. It's just one line, which makes it an offense for anyone to have assets or lead a lifestyle not proportionate to their declared that is good enough. When I made this suggestion several years ago, they said half our MPs and ministers will be in jail. Right? It becomes mandatory, like the ICAC Act. Because if, 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 if they catch you having something and you can't explain, it's an offense already. So that is the answer to all our problems we have been talking about. It encompasses all issues. Uh, supply chain, personal wealth, money laundering, blah, blah. So if you have this act, and it's going to be a typical case of Finland, where you can actually access how much tax your neighbor pays when he buys a new car. So in, 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 in our case, in Malaysia, if, if, if uh, your neighbor buys a new BMW, uh, you, you can report it to the MACC or whoever it is, and they will issue letter to say, please explain the source of your wealth for buying this car. I, I don't want to go deeper into this, but I just want to give you one example. The, the IGP standing orders, which are supposed to be uh, official secrets, okay? I was told this by Dun Hanif, when he was the OCPD in, in the low Anson at that time, one of his Mata Mata uh, bought a Ford Prepack which cost him second and fourth prepack, this one in the 70s, for 2,000 over ringgit. And he said he got a signal from, from HQ asking him to investigate how this fellow got his wealth, this Mata Mata. And he explained, he said, my father sold his Dusun and gave me the money. So they went to the father, father showed records of the Dusun being sold for him to get the money. Now, if that kind of system now operates in the police force, which is still, I think, in, in the IGP standing order, can you imagine how many policemen we asked to explain them? So the question, the answer is, the ICAC, one, one line from the ICAC Act, and that's good enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Nadis. So that will be our next um, project to work on the legislative reform. Um, Alex, please. Okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, so thank you to everyone. So just following on from that bit, I mean, I'm familiar with the ICAC Act. That, that actually, it was very useful in Hong Kong but it only was um, an offense to live beyond your means or not be able to explain uh, your living means for civil servants, okay? But there's a place to start. Um, reversing back in some of the questions about the independence of the uh, MACC, that's a, that's a, a matter for, for the politicians of Malaysia, not me. What I will say, um, the Serious Fraud Office in New Zealand was judicially independent. So written into the Act for the Serious Fraud Office, nobody, could judicially review the director's decision whether or not to prosecute or whether or not to open up an investigation. And we made our own decisions 
on whether to prosecute or not. Didn't have to go through the Attorney General's chambers. Okay? Uh, that which worked well, uh, I think, because that kept us out of out of influence. But that worked well in that country. Um, in terms of the MACC itself, yeah, I do a lot of work with them. I have actually found them bloody good, very dedicated, hardworking. In terms of the laws, I know we just talked about that one, but there are sufficient laws. I think Section 17A is a world-class piece of legislation. That's my personal view. Um, and, and the UK have had it. The, the proof will be in the pudding as to how it's enforced and whether it generates confidence in, in the public. Because one way of getting compliance um, in a way is to, is to whack uh, people. Then lastly, in terms of what is the solution for Malaysia, there's no one big solution for Malaysia or any other country. It's all part of a jigsaw puzzle which plays together. But I think you know, one thing that, that we, we could do, if we, we could have the worst policies and procedures in the world, no policies and procedures, but if people stood up and said something and felt empowered to do so, you'll win the battle. You could have the best policies and paper, uh, but if people don't feel empowered, you're not going to get anywhere. So I think it comes down to if you if you strip away everything, we have the laws in place. If the ordinary person feels empowered to say something, but not only feels empowered, feels compelled to do so, they don't want to see somebody driving drunk down the road. So they're going to say something. They don't want to see somebody taking uh, money. They don't want to see their boss doing something wrong. If we get to that stage, and not only do they feel uncomfortable seeing it, they actually feel compelled and empowered to speak up, knowing they'll be taken seriously, unless they're making a frivolous complaint, obviously, and something will be done about it. That, I think, is, is, is a key. Thank you so much, Alex. The next would be YB Dr. Lee Boon Chai. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me uh, answer some of the questions which have been raised. Uh, first of all, I'd like to comment about this political funding. I think one of the things is if you are living in an environment when there is a lot of uh, intimidation on the opposition, opposition supporter, then transparency in political funding will not work because that will make the level playing field even worse. So I think that's one thing. And I do not think that political funding alone would prevent uh, corruption at uh, just uh, political level. I think we we got to think out of the box and I got no solution to that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, that's one. Number two, about senior officer after retirement, uh, joining private company and especially which are related. Uh, to me, one of the things we got to be clear is this senior government officer, they are talented. So do we want them to join fields which are not in their core competency where their talent will be wasted? Certainly not. I think we'll still be making use of their talent, but certainly the bar for conflict of interest has to be very, very much higher. I think it's duty upon this civil, senior civil servant to prove beyond reasonable doubt, more than the usual ordinary person that there is no conflict of interest when they deal on the other side uh, of the business. So I think that's one we should be looking at. I think of all the things we have discussed, I would like to reiterate uh, three things which I mentioned earlier. We need to overhaul the audit system. Auditing just a process will not do. Number two, we also need to have 360 degree of reporting, making upon a duty for everyone to report. Report up, report down, report your colleague, report uh, supplier, report uh, consumer, uh, and so on. 360 degree reporting as a duty by law. And uh, number three, implementation of negative list and positive list. And I think this should be the key areas where we should look at. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee Boon Chai. Um, just, I know this is not a forum on political funding, but uh, you were talking about what the solutions are. Um, actually, IDEAS is also investigating this, and uh, we think that we, we do have some solutions, and I'll be happy to speak with you further. Um, on the audit process, it's interesting. We just had a conversation as well with the National Audit um, 
department, the Jabatan Audit Negara. And uh, it seems actually quite systematic, but I think, yeah, of course, there's always improvements that can be made. I want to ask um, Uni and Mark to just give some final thoughts, and then I'm just going to close this because we are already very, very much over time. So, uh, Sri Munyati, please. Uh, thank you, Tracy. I just want to say thank you for everyone here. And I, I just want to say that ideas research and CBI research is only like a tip of the iceberg. So more research, like especially focusing on each, you know, value chain and really understand it and identify this risk of corruption is very important. And that's probably another research agenda that we need to do. But I want to reiterate again, the importance for us to have this procurement legislations, because a lot of things, while we have indeed a very robust procurement rules now, it can be improved. And especially disclosure requirement that can be required if we have procurement legislation. Lastly, I just want to actually respond to audit, the performance audit. Actually, the audit Negara did a performance audit now. But of course, it's very limited, right? So in the report, we can find, say, for example, all oh, this project tidak memenuhi, you know, doesn't achieve its, its outcome. So that's really good, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a small, like, small amount in, like, in so many government projects. So that maybe can be improved. The capacity of the audit to actually do performance audit needs to be improved. So again, thank you, Trisha, and I think I will pass it to Mark now. Thank you. Mark, please go right. ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for all the panelists for your valuable information, input, and thoughts. Uh, basically, what we are um, looking at is in order for change, this value of anti-corruption and uh, integrity has to be embedded in our heart, in everybody's heart. Otherwise, if people were to get, want to get shortcut in order to enrich themselves, you will never be able to solve the problem. All right, thank you very much. We will work on together with ideas on this project. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the panelists again. Uh, thanks for spending your Tuesday morning and all of us are hungry now. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize that it has gone uh, very much over time, but I think that uh, many of the participants actually stayed throughout, which means that this is a topic close to everyone's heart. Uh, as uh, Uni, my colleague mentioned, we want to do more. So if anyone is ever interested in investigating uh, parts of this research and delving deeper into the subject, uh, please get in touch with either Mark from CBI or myself at Ideas, and we'll be more than happy to exchange um, interactions and, and research as well with you. So with that, please continue to follow our work, uh, our Facebook page, and we have more exciting reports in the months to come. Uh, once again, terima kasih and have a great day ahead, everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>